My name is Ali. I'm a doctor and YouTuber. I'm Taymor. I'm a data scientist and writer. And you're listening to Not Overthinking, the weekly podcast where we think about happiness, creativity, and the human condition. Hello, and welcome back to Not Overthinking. Taymor, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, mate. Thanks a lot. I'm, uh, I'm actually feeling a bit sick, but I, I won't bore you with the details. But I think I go through phases of my life where I just feel like low-key sick for no reason. And I can't tell if it's because I haven't had enough sleep or if I haven't eaten enough or whatever, but I've been feeling low-key sick today. <laughs> Wait, uh, I thought you said you weren't going to bore me with the details. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, but no, I'm, I'm on the whole pretty good. Um, little update from Japan. It turns out in Okinawa, no one really speaks English. There's not really any foreigners and there's not too much going on. Um, we're quite keen on like trying to meet some people, uh, particularly some locals. I want to improve my Japanese. Um, but yeah, it's just proving extremely difficult. Like we're basically just hanging out the two of us. Our friend Lewis, who's, who's here doing a PhD, he never wants to hang out with us. We've seen him like once. <laughs> so uh, yeah, things are great. <laughs> oh man, so desk car. <laughs> yeah no no but one thing i have noticed which i think is slightly interesting unlike everything i've said so far is that basically i've you know i've watched a, a moderate amount of anime for over the past sort of 10 to 15 years and so like listening to a lot of japanese and kind of reading subtitles i feel like my brain understands the structure of the language and so it really is just a matter of me learning specific vocabulary words um but one and like when when i do that it's like amazing. Like if, if I if I read like a Japanese phrase dictionary online or something or watch a YouTube video where they're teaching Japanese phrases, then it's actually super satisfying because all the words sound super familiar because I've heard them all in like anime and stuff. Um, and then you're kind of attaching meaning to these things that already kind of mean something to you. So that's really, really satisfying. Whereas I think if you're kind of learning a language from scratch, kind of how they teach you French at school, it's like, oh, here's a new word. Great, new word, well done me. Whereas this is like, oh, that's what that phrase means. Oh, that's how that works. And you can kind of like infer specific grammar rules and stuff based on like the sort of patterns that you already have in your head for this language that you've been listening to for the past 10 years. Do you know what I mean? Oh, so it's, so it's kind of like uh, that thing about exploration versus discovery. What was that analogy that you used? Yeah, it's exactly like that. Yeah, so I've sort of spent the past 10 years kind of exploring Japanese intuitively, I suppose, by just hearing lots of it and seeing a translation. A bit like how babies kind of learn, right? They just hear a bunch of stuff in various contexts and they kind of infer meanings and things from that. I've sort of been through a phase of that and now kind of reading the actual theory and definitions and stuff is actually super fun, way more fun than it should be. Oh man, that sounds pretty good. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in Japan in about 10 days time. I'd, is it 10 days time? Yeah, it is 10 days time. Exciting. Oh, nice. How are you doing? Sorry, I, I shouldn't use going... the word exciting because because you're not a fan of the word exciting, are you? Yeah, kind of exciting, exciting is cancelled. Uh, but I, I hear you're going to Spain t tomorrow or something. What are you doing in Spain? Uh, yeah, going to Sevilla, Seville, Sevilla uh, tonight. So it's now 10, uh, 10 in the morning in the UK. And so I'm flying out at like 6 p.m. Uh, so going for four or five days, just hanging out with some of my uh, me wholesome medic friends, uh, the, the, the same crew as who we went to the Cotswolds with. Pretty, oh, yeah. But you're in Japan, so... Yeah, oh. you weren't invited. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks for that. Oh, but that sounds great. They're they're a really nice bunch. They are indeed. Yeah. So I'm quite looking forward to that. Hence why we're recording this podcast a few days in advance, uh, so that we don't get that last minute scramble on a Sunday to be like, oh crap, we need to get out a podcast today. Yeah. Anyway, cool. I, so I what are we talking chat. about today? Cool. So I have a topic in mind, and uh, it's it's good that we sort of ended the preamble on you talking about going on holiday with your friends because one thing I've been thinking about recently is sort of. Intent, intentionality when it comes to socializing. Um, so like, I think, I think social, I, I think I, I enjoy socializing and it's like one of the most meaningful and rewarding things that I do, but I feel like I'm not that intentional about it. Like I have a few groups of friends, you know, back in London, in Okinawa, I have, I have one, one, well, I had two friends. Turns out one of them doesn't really like me. I have one friend here in Okinawa. Um, and, but you know, back, back in London, I have various groups of friends uh, we, you know, I occasionally meet with them for like dinner and stuff. Maybe once every six weeks or something, we'll have a sleepover at someone's house. Um, apart from that, I I'm not really too intentional about how I socialize. And that, and that sort of includes how I meet new people and how I socialize with my existing friends. And to be honest, for the past couple of years, I've just kind of done the same stuff. Yeah, I've been quite intentional about going on uh, a sort of low social optionality holiday 
every now and then, you know, every few months. I've been intentional about that. But apart from that, I haven't really been too intentional about the context in which I socialize and things like that. Um, but I do hear, like, I, I often catch wind of uh, of people in other parts of the world, you know, people like on, on Twitter and stuff uh, who are in the same circles as me. I feel like there are people who are super, super intentional about socializing. And they're the kind of people that sort of, you know, connect different groups of their friends together based on mutual interests and stuff and organize like dinners, you know, with random people and plus their friends and, you know, that kind of stuff to kind of connect groups and all, all this kind of thing. And I've never really done any of that. And it seems like an interesting uh, sort of, yeah, an interesting thing to kind of think about and do. Um, so I'll stop talking there. What, what, how, how intentional are you about your socializing? So I've certainly started to become more intentional about it since graduating from university, because as you know, when, when we're at university, socializing just kind of happens by default. Um, although I suppose even, even at university, I was fairly intentional about it at, at the beginning, because obviously when, when going into university, I had that same anxiety that everyone does about, you know, will I make friends and, and stuff like that. And I I'd, I'd been reading this sort of like, you know, socialize self self helpy stuff for several years at that point. And so I knew that going into university, I wanted to kind of be the instigator of a lot of socializing because I knew that, you know, someone's got to do it, it might as well be me. And so in my first year, I would for example instigate like hangouts in my room and like movie nights and then as I ascended the ranks of the Pakistan Society leadership, uh, I started uh, <laughs> running more of these like in intentional socializing kind of events and making a point making it a point that every week or like every week once or twice a week we would have some sort of either structured or semi-structured socializing sesh whether it's like a curry night or a pizza night or a movie night board games uh, that sort of stuff um and the way i approached it was you know just starting out with a few people that i knew were coming just like three or four people that would you know make the event a success you know, I say event, that would make it success even if no one else turned up. And then I would just open the invite to kind of the whole WhatsApp group chat to anyone who, anyone else who wanted to come. And that was, I think, a good way of approaching the university thing because it meant that it gave people an option for something to do that evening. So, you know, if they were busy with work or something else, then fine, like no one cares if they don't turn up. But if they were at a loose end and didn't have anything to do, then at least it, give the, it gave them an option. And at least... Um, the f in in the first term of each year sort of when the freshers were settling in and, and stuff like that i think that was really valuable in getting people getting people involved um and i i, th I think i do want to do more of that sort of stuff these days i just haven't really haven't really done so all right so we actually just got disconnected for about about an hour uh but i uh i get i've gotten the gist of uh of what you were saying ali um, you know, at university as Paxop president, you, there was a lot, a lot of like structured thinking around how to socialize and how to kind of provide an environment for, for people to socialize in. And you want to kind of apply this more to your life now. And, and I totally agree. I think within, within like the university framework, like certainly as part of a society and stuff, there is an active effort to organize activities and to think about how to help people make new friends and meet new people and all this kind of stuff. But I haven't really been in that mode since university uh, to be honest, i wasn't really in that mode that much during university i mean i i wasn't like president of the paxoc or anything like that um having done that quite a lot at university in in, in fairness that in fairness that wasn't from lack of trying oh, really, oh, oh, was it? very good yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so i mean you did a lot of it at university uh, why uh, oh. for the listeners uh, i'm referencing the fact that Taymor applied to become the president of the Islamic Society, and he was the only candidate to apply for the role. But uh, he still didn't get it because more people voted for Ron, i.e. reopen nominations, than voted for Taymor. Uh, so they would have rather had no one than have Taymor being president. Uh, just, just, you know, just putting it out there. <laughs> yep, that's absolutely correct. Um, I'm over it. You know, it took, uh, it didn't take long. Just just a couple of years, but it's it's all it's all good now. I've I've moved past the trauma. Um, back to the topic at hand. Well, how? Yeah, it's good to share these things out in the open. You know, they say that a problem shared is a problem half. Yeah. Do you want to keep talking about this? Let's. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm. I'm You're fine. good. All right. <laughs> Continue with what Thank you were going to say. <laughs> I was I was trying to say, <laughs> given that you were actively organizational around socializing at university. 
Have you carried that on? I mean, I remember you said a while ago that you started trying to have regular board uh, board game nights at, at your flat and stuff like that. Yeah, I've been sort of loosely trying it on uh, as such for the last for the last two years almost. Um, but I don't know, like I I don't want to be the guy to just like sort of bring bring excuses, but it's surprisingly hard to have like a regular activity given that almost everyone I know is a doctor and we all have very weird rotors. Oh, okay. Um, one thing that one thing that Molly does, uh, which she does very well, is that they have this. Um, we've got this like. Uh, Every Tuesday, there's uh, the option to go bowling. And, you know, we've got the, the, there's this like Facebook Messenger chat. And every Monday, someone is going to be like, right, who's up for bowling tomorrow? And it seems like every week, a certain number of people like go to the bowling thing. I'm personally not a huge fan of bowling. So I've only been a couple of times. But it seems like this is a weekly standing order that kind of happens come rain or shine. And th- there would be some weeks where um, no one would be available because everyone's on call. But for the most part, they managed to get it done. And I think a big part of that is just by having a specific date, like a, a, a weekly standing order as like, this is going to be our default social activity to do at, at this time. And I haven't really done that with board games night um, yet, but it, it is on the cards. I do I do want to want to set something like that up. Yeah, so I've heard, I think the standing order thing is really good. And I've heard from other people. Actually, I think I think maybe I heard this from you and you read it in a book of some sort where like you should have, I don't know, some book or uh, probably Tim Ferriss or something was recommending that you have like every, I, I don't know, every, every week or every month, but every, I think like every week you should have like a scheduled dinner, uh, the equivalent of like dinner with the boys, <laughs> the boys being, the boys being oh, a proxy yes. for like your close, close, very close knit inner circle group of friends. And you should do this like every week. No, so, so where, so where I read this was was actually in the context of, you know, scheduling a dinner with the boys, uh, because this was in an article about the loneliness of middle aged uh, of uh, middle aged people, specifically from the perspective of middle aged men who kind of their the lives get sort of caught up with the families and things. And then they find they don't have time for the friends that they you know had for the boys that they had great times with. And so what the journalist suggests is that, you know, just have this once a week schedule where, you know, Wednesday night is dinner with the boys or pub with the boys or something with the boys. And, you know, everything else gets scheduled around that. And like the wife and the kids know that Wednesday night is your time with the boys and therefore don't interrupt it. Um, and it was really recommending that sort of standing order as something, oh, okay. something useful. Something useful for middle-aged men to stay connected with their friends. Uh, yeah, with the right. boys. <laughs> with the boys, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, I think it was probably a couple. Of, I, I I do remember reading this article. I remember it was doing the rounds. To, to be honest, it seems like nowadays, almost every few weeks, there is a new article doing the rounds about the loneliness epidemic and how you know people lose touch with their friends and kind of get more isolated and stuff. And uh, you know, we live in a society, blah blah blah. Um, and so I think it's it's it seems to be a topic that's quite uh, top of mind uh, for for a lot of people at the moment. And I, I think that's partly why I'm sort of. Tr- trying to actively uh, sort of think more more about it. I mean, so why haven't you implemented the dinner with the boys, given that you were spreading the good word of it to other people about a year or two ago? Uh, so again, partly because I, I think if I were living in London, I would have implemented a dinner with the boys because there are just so many more boys in London than there are in Cambridge. Uh, there are a handful of boys in Cambridge and they're all doctors that I know. And therefore, you know, our schedules don't line up to the point where we can have a weekly dinner thing. Um, unless we were to have like a very large group of maybe sort of 10, 10 to 20 people of which, you know, at any at any given week, maybe only three or four would be able to turn up to dinner with the boys. But I don't quite have that extensive a social circle in Cambridge for that, for that to be the case. Um, I think definitely if I were living in London, it would be more of a thing. But one, one concept I came across uh, recently is that sort of instead of doing it as like a, a weekly thing, um, one of my other friends has set up this uh, uh, second Sunday brunch, which is that every second Sunday, there's going to be a standing order for a group of people to go out for brunch and whoever can make it goes goes to make it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a weekly thing. I think just this idea of a standing order that everyone is on board with. And I think partly the fact that all these, you know, loneliness of <laughs> loneliness epidemic things are doing the rounds mean that suggesting the idea to the boys or to the girls or whatever uh, I say to girls, I just mean, boys. Uh, <laughs> you know, floating the idea, floating the idea to the boys would be likely met with more uh, enthusiasm than the skepticism that I imagine it might have been met with. Before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the standing, yeah, it seems like a no brainer. And like, I often find myself thinking that, I mean, I, I essentially leave my 
I leave my my seshes down to chance. Like there are okay, so I have like a one or one or two sort of really close knit sort of small internet groups of friends, um, and we have like a group chat and stuff. Um, actually, I'd say there is one. There's only there's one like very inner circle where there, there's like a group chat where where people are posting things there's three of us and there's one in a ring ah very it. good in a ring that there's a reference to a uh, a lewis carroll speech that ali and i are big fans of and that we every week we sit down for a podcast topic for the past about mu- about the past month and i always throw out there oh we should talk about that in a ring essay by lewis carroll and then we always think ah no we probably want to like summarize it in some concise way and that'll take a bit of work and stuff um anyway what I was saying was I have one very close knit intimate group of boys. There's like three of us in this group chat. The group chat is active every day, you know, sharing memes, random, like, you know, how's it going lads kind of thing. And we pretty much meet up about once a week, occasionally once every two weeks. Uh, but yeah, probably on average about once a week, but with almost all my other groups of friends and sort of individual friends, it basically comes down to chance of like, you know, was there some random thing that one of us ha- messaged the other one about that then sparked a, oh, hey, we haven't we haven't had hung out in a while. Let's get brunch this weekend or something, you know? And like occasionally like a, mo- a month or like six weeks will go by where there hasn't been any tangible reason to message each other. And so there hasn't been any, oh, hey, we should can we should hang out. It's been a while. And so I think having a standing order with with those kinds of boys would actually be really nice because they're people I you know, really, really enjoy spending time with um, and want to spend more time <laughs> more time with. But yeah, for some reason, we just leave it down to chance. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Um, so perhaps one, one solution then is why not just create a standing order with your current uh, intimate uh, group chat and then just extend the invitation out to, you know, just using like a WhatsApp broadcast or something, send a message out to anyone who you think you'd want to invite to brunch and then if they can make it they make it and if not then yeah start a little bl- like that seems like a, a very a very high measure but low uh low um friction way of inviting lots of people to you know do like a standing order thing yeah like a almost like a brunch club yeah almost like a brunch club you know perhaps you know every every saturday brunch will be just like a default activity <laughs> and whoever can make it comes and whoever can't then all right see you next week yeah that sounds great uh, and actually, that, a similar thought has crossed my mind in the past, but I've never actually bothered implementing it. But now that we are doing a whole podcast about it, it might actually push me towards doing that. However, I happen to be on the other side of the world uh, with no friends right now. So I mean, I'll have to wait a few weeks before I, before I can actually do that. Or alternatively, you could you could set up a brunch club in Okinawa. <laughs> uh, you can learn the Japanese. <laughs> would, you, would you like to be my friend? <laughs> and then... <laughs> Anyway, so there were a few other instances, uh, a, f- a few other example, uh, a few other examples of intentional socializing that I've um, I was brainstorming while you were disconnected with your internet for about an hour. Um, firstly, it's sort of a reference to the fact that I'm going to Spain later this evening, uh, which is looming, and I still need to pack. But with this group of friends, uh, we've done like a, a really good thing in that we've got like a group chat and. Every every four months, so every kind of medical placement, because we all rotate every four months into into new jobs. Towards the start of the placements, we like one of the people in the group sends sends out a doodle poll <laughs> with all of the available weekends, and everyone fills their rota into that doodle poll, and we come up with okay, let's let's go somewhere on you know the fourteenth of November to the eighteenth of November, and then it seems like two people can't make it, and then therefore they've got two months to arrange swaps, and so far we've actually arranged like a hangout like this, a little low optionality group holiday, every single placement. And that's something that I really hope will continue. Um, but I think it's very much dependent on certain people in the group kind of being very uh, much the go-getters and actively setting up the doodle poll and, and stuff like that. So I think as long as you have someone who takes the initiative to do that sort of thing, I think everyone is really, uh, like we all really value the fact that this happens and we all really appreciate the effort that goes into organizing it and like sorting out Airbnb and stuff so that the rest of us don't really have to think about yeah. it too hard. Um, so maybe, yeah, if that sort of thing doesn't exist for your friendship group, the idea would be to kind of just be the initiator, <laughs> send out the doodle poll and, and then just make yeah, it Yeah, that's amazing. That's actually really, really phenomenal. And I remember like, yeah, I mean, I remember I went, I, I've tagged along on a couple of these with you guys. Probably the first one was like two years ago. The second one was maybe like almost a year ago or something. And it's it's just such a cool setup. It's like, 
yeah, I mean, once again, with, with my friends, you know, we happen to kind of by chance do one of these kinds of things every few months, but it really isn't very intentional. And it basically relies on one person kind of being like, hey, guys, let's sort of uh, do this thing. What? Who who uh, the thing I find interesting about your group sort of group holiday friends the the ones you're talking about is that you don't actually hang out that much outside of the group holidays, do you? No, because we're all in scattered in different parts. Oh, of the okay. So the group holidays is really like the the kind of the main time where you see each other, and you don't. I, I, is, is the yeah is the group chat active and in between? The group chat is reasonably active. Yeah, um, it's, I think it's helpful that everyone is a medic, and so it's it it almost becomes like a a uh, support group if if you have a bad day at work or something or if you want to share a medical meme or some you know or anything inappropriate about one of your patients then you just shove it into the group chat um and it sort of it sort of stays ticking along and then obviously there's a big uptick in the sort of the anticipation and the approach to these group holidays um and yeah we occasionally hang out at other times if it's for example someone's birthday then people will make the effort to kind of travel to london or travel to manchester or, or whatever for that event but yeah it's mostly the group holidays where we kind of catch up on mass yeah, that's really cool. I think, yeah, I, I definitely like to be more proactive about organizing. Okay, the issue is I really, in my life, I just don't think more than about two weeks ahead or something. I probably don't even think two weeks ahead. And so the idea of like planning some planning a holiday like four months in advance or something, it just seems very alien to me. Do you know what I mean? But I think, like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. But obviously, yeah, clearly you've got to get over yeah. that because, you know, <laughs> holidays are generally planned ages and that uh, that was one thing that um molly brought up uh, just just like casually ages ago that her family seems to organize the next year's holiday before the current year's holiday is even done. oh wow and it's just like su- a, such a, a a good level of organization that goes into yeah. this sort of stuff uh, it just it's it's quite it's quite like inspiring in a way yeah i always yeah you often hear about and like in movies and stuff these sort of classic families where they sort of go to the same place you know the, there's a, a family summer holiday every year where they kind of like go to the same place that they've been going for like you know since the kids were born and all this kind of stuff and it's all very like routine uh, that always seemed like an interesting concept um yeah that seems like a really like a whole, wholesome activity that i'd love to i'd love to get on and partly that is why i want to i want to do that thing that uh the blogger tynan recommends which is that you club together with like 10 friends and just buy a house in a city that you enjoy visiting like budapest or tokyo or something because then that gives you a great default location where you can all just go almost at a moment's notice without having to worry about accommodation because you've bought this house that's just chilling there in the city um and that means that every few months or every year you can have like a standing order where everyone meets up in this one place i think that's that's something to work to work towards yeah that's very nice um there were a couple of uh, there were a couple of other things that i recently started doing so uh, are you familiar with this concept of uh, like masterminds and mastermind yes. retreats and stuff that are popular yeah, in the tech yeah, community? Yeah. yeah. So the uh, kind of my understanding of that is that the the idea is that you would sort of find some of your boys slash girls in the tech community, for example, um, and go on a retreat for ten days to the I don't know some national park in the U.S. and you'd rent a cottage and stuff. Uh, but within that, you would do like hiking and activities and things, but you'd also have some like structured time to talk through your what's going on in your life and what your business slash personal problems are so everyone would kind of get in a circle and then every day two people would take the floor for about half an hour and share how their business is doing and what's going on in their lives and asking for people's opinions in the group about what they could be doing next and because you've got this group of 10 like-minded people who are all tech people running their own businesses you get to hear sort of 10 different perspectives about what you can do about your problem and then you rinse and repeat this for everyone in the group and that becomes like a the the semi-structured evening activity to do and then during the daytime you might like go for hikes in the mountains or, or whatever so i really liked this idea of um sort of giving people the time and space to talk through their stuff and so uh, a couple of a couple of weekends ago i went out for brunch with some of my boys uh you would have been invited but you were in oh. japan sadly or in hawaii or, or whatever you know just for the record i would have yeah. invited you uh so, so make sure you invite me to your next uh next holiday um anyway so we were all having some uh curry over you know over lunch slash brunch there were like five of us and i it, like a little bit tongue in cheek, I kind of floated the idea that, hey, guys, I think we should try out this semi-structured sharing, you know, the the three S's because I love the alliteration, uh, semi-structured sharing. And I, I floated this mastermind concept. And the idea was that 
uh, we'd, we, we'd go around in a circle and each one would update everyone else on what's been going on in our lives for the last six months because it had been up to six months since the last time I saw them uh, and what, what problems they were struggling with kind of professionally and personally. And everyone initially was a bit like, oh, lol, okay. Uh, but I think everyone, or every, everyone kind of wanted to do this. And it was really good that it was the level of enthusiasm rather than immediately being shut down like, oh my God. And I suppose initially everyone was kind of like, oh, lol, okay, you know. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it, it was really good because the dynamic in this particular group was such that everyone was kind of kind of enthusiastic about it and was open open to the experience. Whereas I think in certain other groups, it would have been that sort of idea would have been immediately shut down with, like, oh my god, you know, socializing is supposed to be natural, not it's not oh, like structured, you know, yeah. that that sort of vibe. But it was really nice, and I think this worked for a few reasons. So, firstly, we all you know just generally like talking about ourselves and wanna wanna get our our friends' perspective on the various things that we're struggling with. Um, secondly, our friends probably want to hear this from us. Like, I would love to hear about what my friends are doing and what they're struggling with, so I can kind of yeah just because they're, they're my friends and it's a, it's a good thing to to hear but also i think that while we want to talk about this stuff and we want to we want to listen to it it's not the sort of thing that comes up very easily in natural conversation like in natural conversation you might touch on something but i think you know i would feel very very awkward about kind of speaking for five minutes about myself um in like a very kind of selfish way even though other people might want to hear that. And so it, in a way, gives us all permission to talk about these things that we want to talk about. But, you know, we've got, we, we've laid out the structure of the setting in a way that it gives, it gives us permission and no one has to feel bad about, about hogging the floor, as it were. Yeah. Um, so I thought that, were, that worked really well. Have you, ever, have you tried anything like that? Like, what, what do you think of that semi-structured sharing? semi-structured sharing i haven't actually tried that again it's it's something so the, this kind of mastermind group idea has been on my radar uh i think i was sort of introduced to it when i was uh living in san francisco about a year ago and like yeah people there seem to yeah there, there are certainly groups like this uh where founders kind of get together once a month or something um yeah or either a retreat or kind of a dinner and they kind of yeah intentionally kind of talk through problems and things and yeah, like sitting down and talking about it with you now, it's it seems like a no brainer <laughs> to do to do this stuff because I mean, just as it, you know, what, when I was earlier describing how yeah, the fact that with a lot of my friends who I really enjoy spending time with, I basically leave it down to chance when we end up hanging out. It sounded really stupid. I sounded like a moron because, like, why would you do that, right? <laughs> and in the same way, like, I think you're you're absolutely right that like. Uh, you know, the, a lot of things just don't come up in conversation naturally, or it's like socially unacceptable to just take the floor for five minutes and talk about yourself. And so why would you, why would you leave conversation topics completely down to chance? I mean, sure, the serendipity is nice, spontaneity, all that good stuff. But there are also surely lots of important things that are worth discussing and, you know, worth bringing up that just won't come up naturally. And so like leaving the entire field of socializing down to chance just seems really, really bad. Okay, so I'm going to experiment with the semi-structured sharing uh, on this upcoming holiday in Spain, uh, and <laughs> I will I'll report back in the uh, insight for next week's podcast to let you know how that goes. Yeah, that'll be great. One thing that I tried uh, with a couple of my friends was almost like this mastermind thing. But I mean, are, are you familiar with the idea of like weekly sprints, Ali? Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, weekly what? Sprints. Uh, vaguely. Uh, but do you want to explain it anyway, in case I'm? Yeah. Okay. So. So one way to kind of, this is done a lot in tech. I'm sure it's done in other fields as well. Uh, one way to kind of organize work is to sort of plan it on like a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And so every every week you sort of take part in a sprint where like you've planned all your work ahead of time. You've planned like what your goals are and stuff. And then at the end of the sprint, you kind of, uh, you know, take some time to reflect on how you did against those goals, uh, you know, what you can improve for next time and that kind of stuff. You have a little like sprint retrospective. Uh, and so in like, you know, in most tech companies, the work is done on like two week sprints. Um, and then you kind of sit, sit down and, and talk about it afterwards. Um, and I, I tried doing a similar thing with a couple of my friends where, you know, we all have various things that we're working on in our lives uh, for like personal growth and kind of side hustle or like work stuff or, or whatever. And we all we all have these things we're trying to improve at and these goals we're trying to reach. Um, and so we, we we tried for a while to sort of set up this this kind of weekly sprint thing where we'd have like a video call at the start of the week 
uh, where we'd kind of talk about, you know, what we want to do that week. And then at the end of the week, we'd have sort of a, a video call reflecting on it um, and, you know, talking about what we can improve and all this kind of stuff in, in, in the hopes that it will keep us all more accountable to uh, ourselves and, and sort of to one another with kind of meeting our goals. It just, the thing is, we it, I think it was a really nice idea, very like structured and intentional, like, you know, we should do this thing. It just kind of fizzled out. I think we did it like twice or something and then it just didn't happen. But I think back then I didn't run my life with a calendar. And I think I think I think the calendar could actually be a game changer for all of this stuff. Because I mean, even be- between you and me, we ha- for the past like three podcast sessions, since we've both been not physically co-located, we ha- and you know, there's there's a massive time zone difference. We have had to basically put it in the calendar. And pu- I think putting it in the calendar like a few days ahead of time has been I know I, I found it amazing in terms of like organizing my life around it and in terms of like trying to think uh, a little bit ahead of time about what we should talk about on the podcast. And yeah, I, I imagine if you just set up a recurring calendar event for these kinds of, you know, brunch club and weekly sprint retrospective with the boys or whatever, it just won't fall by the wayside. Whereas you're not having, yeah, it's, it, it goes back to what we were saying a, a few weeks ago about kind of having systems for things and sort of treating your personal life like a business, you know? Yeah, mate, I think I think this calendar thing is is genuinely a game changer because like I've, I've been on the calendar hype for, for years, but like uh, prior to my friends graduating and starting jobs, no one else was really on the calendar hype. And so this thing of calendar events was just, just not a thing. But now like if I actually just took my friends' emails, they all run their lives on Google Calendar, you know, work-wise. And so having a weekly brunch with the boys or or equivalent would actually yeah. be very doable. Um, I also really like this, the idea of the of the sprint thing. So like I've recently uh, started working with um, another editor for my videos who's helping kind of write some of the content. And I always kind of struggle with figuring out what we're going to do for a given week. So maybe we'll try doing it in sprints and just have a, like a catch-up call before and after just so we're aware of what's what's happening for the week. I think that might actually be quite a good, quite a good plan. Yeah, I think it's a very kind of natural way to sort of structure work. And and one of the things I I, I think the best thing about this kind of, you know, sprint system, whatever you want to call it, um, is that you, at the end of a sprint, you kind of have this retrospective where you talk about, where you sort of look back on what you did, but you also reflect on improving the process by which you did those things. And so you're, you know, uh, going, going back to like the tech example, you know, you'll go kind of look back on like, okay, these were the tasks we wanted to do this week. Uh, these are the ones we accomplished. What were, what were like the, the, the common things that were kind of stopping us from accomplishing our tasks or slowing us down and that kind of stuff. And how can we kind of remove those obstacles going forward? So you're, you're sort of iterating on the process of actually doing the stuff. Uh, and I think that's, that's sort of a nice way to, it, 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 it's sort of like taking the first derivative, like, right. It's, it, it's like sort of second order thinking about, uh, sort of your life and, and kind of the, the, the forces that, uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Like, as you were, as you were talking, I was like, oh my God, I should, I should totally start doing this. Um, yeah. One thing as well, as, as, as well that I wanted to do about the calendar thing. So uh, my boy, Matt Diavello recently released a video talking about how he tracked everything in his life on his calendar for about three months um, and how that actually made him change all the, like a lot of the decisions he was making with his time, because now he knew where his time was going and he knew what he was able to schedule out blocks for, for certain things. And I've sort of tried to do that recently um, with things like going to the gym, where, whereby, you know, at the start of the week, I'll figure out that, okay, this is my schedule for the week and I'm going to go to the gym on these on these days. And even if I haven't gone on those days, it's, it's, it's at least given me that default option rather than just kind of having a blank calendar evening thing and thinking, ah, oh, okay, I guess I should do some kind of YouTube stuff, some kind of gym stuff, some kind of like, like whatever, not really knowing what to do. So maybe kind of yeah. going back more, going back again to your pilot and plane analogy, uh, analogy, it's sort of taking stock at the start of a week and thinking, okay, what do I actually want to accomplish this week? Blocking it out in the calendar, including things like socializing, which are obviously the most important parts of, of life and health, physical health, mental health, whatever. Blocking out all those things and then sort of having those as, 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 as default activities. And this is something that the authors say in the book, uh, Make Time as well basically they say no no it's not make time it's in uh that that is that that newish book uh indistractable that's been doing the rounds in all the podcasts i think his his fundamental yeah that's one yeah um and his his like fundamental thesis is that the um opposite the the opposite of distraction isn't uh i don't know he he, he says that the opposite of distraction is traction and that you can't 
say that you're distracted and that you don't know what to do with your life unless you had something that you were going to be doing in that time. So he talks about how wow. friends tell him that, oh, yeah, I, 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 I always get a, end, up, end up getting distracted on via Instagram. And he says, OK, show me your calendar. And he finds there was nothing on the calendar for the, what they were going to do instead. So, so his whole yeah. spiel is that you've got to have something that you're going to do because then, you know, <laughs> then you know what the intention is. You know what you're trying not to get distracted from. And so I really want to start doing this calendar um, time blocking life planning thing thing from now on yeah absolutely uh ditto ev everything you've just said um like, i i like, think let's, let's just take a step back here and sort of uh summarize kind of what we've discussed there's one more thing i'd like to kind of talk about actually um but i i think in general what i've kind of yeah how, how i've kind of summarized this in my head and structured it is that in our social lives the default is to not really have any kind of structure and leave everything down to chance. And based on this conversation, it now sounds ridiculous to leave something as important as socializing down to chance. And so you can kind of build in, there's two ways to kind of get some structure and intentionality in there. You can have structure around the social sessions. So like, you know, when you meet up, the frequency of the meeting up, uh, who you meet up with and, uh, and, you know, kind of having standing calendar, uh, calendar events or whatever for like brunch every two weeks with the boys and that kind of thing. That, that, that seems amazing. Uh, and, and then in, in addition to having structure around the social sessions, you can have structure within the social sessions to make sure that the important things which don't often come up will actually end up getting discussed. And, you know, you'll end up kind of, yeah, working through the things that you, that will benefit everyone, but that by chance just, just, generally won't actually happen uh so structure within and structure around uh the social sessions is, is kind of how oh, man. i've categorized that's a, that's this that's discussion a good way of in my thinking head. about it yeah um so I, I think that's pretty good and that's something i'm gonna i'm gonna start sort of thinking more on and trying to take an active kind of participation in uh the the thing the other thing i thought it'd be cool to discuss is kind of almost like a taxonomy of like sessions <laughs> so like I think there are certainly, I think different kinds of social seshes. Is there a better word? Let's just call it sesh. We'll miss out the social. Different seshes have like qualitatively different vibes. I think there are certain, I, okay, I want us to come up with like a good delineation of seshes uh, to kind of, oh, I almost like to categorize them. I think one like really big and sort of standalone one is the low social optionality group holiday sesh. I think that is like qualitatively different from any other kind of socializing that, that you kind of do with anyone. I'm sure you agree. And let, let's try and just like think about what the what a, a sensible like categorization of seshes is. Because I mean, I'll just throw a few examples of types of seshes out there that I have had. Uh, so I think the low social optionality group holiday is one. I think the kind of the kind of two hour, two to three hour dinner in the evening after work on a weekday. I think that's another kind of sesh. I think the Saturday brunch is another kind of sesh, or you know, weekend brunch is another kind of sesh. Um, I think a sleepover is also another kind of sesh. Yeah, I, I would I would add to that list and say a board games night is a different sort of sesh. Um, why, why is, well, no, why, why is a board games night uh, sort of a different kind of sesh to like dinner? dinner oh because, I, guess, I guess because you've got this default group activity that you're doing and that is the focus of it and the and and the conversations happen kind of in, incidentally around it but also not uh, as in like if you if you've got the right group of people that are, that's actually invested in the board game you will you, you won't have that many deep conversations happening outside of the context of that you'll just have a little bit of chit chat when someone's rolling the dice or, or something like that whereas in a dinner you've got a lot more scope for the the socializing plays more of a main stage in a dinner, whereas it plays less of a main stage at a board games night with the right group of people. Oh, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. And I suppose that's sort of similar I'd... to, for example, playing playing squash or badminton or, you know, any kind of sporting activity where the activity takes center stage rather than the socializing. The socializing kind of fills fills the gap. Yeah, this reminds me of something that Jimmy Carr actually said. I think, do you, do you remember when we went to see uh, Jimmy Carr and Alain de Botton uh, in London? uh sort of live jimmy uh, car live oh i do you remember I that there. oh no you weren't there i actually went with uh yeah one of my friends and one of my work colleagues um uh, anyway jimmy, invite, said, uh, jimmy jimmy car said this thing about basically the the difference between i uh, used to talk about like relationships or something and like finding a life partner or something or his relationship with his wife or something and he he made a distinction between 
something something along the lines of that you know that there's a difference between kind of looking at each other and looking in the same direction and i think like a a looking at each, a dinner would be like a looking at each other kind of activity uh, a, a kind of sesh whereas a looking in the same direction kind of sesh would be like playing sports together or playing board games together i think those two are actually qualitatively different and both kind of special in their own right and to be honest i, pr I probably don't do enough of the looking in the same direction kind of act mm. uh, kind of seshes I, pr I i probably almost exclusively actually do the looking at each other um and yeah i think yeah i think that that's a useful kind of separation to make because I think it's nice to kind of have both of those dynamics. Yeah, I think that's a really good, a really good distinction. I wonder if low social optionality group holidays would come more under the, under the uh, looking at the same. I, I, I suppose if it's a holiday, it's you're a looking bit... at each other in the evenings, and then while you're hiking, you're looking in the same direction. You hope. Yeah, I think that's partly why I'm just such a huge fan of them. It's because it has it, it sort of has a bit of both. Like you have the kind of like. And I think road trips are interesting because it's kind of a bit of both, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think like group holidays kind of have, they have it all. Uh, and that's why they're really special. And I, I probably don't really have that much diversity in the types of sesh that I have uh, generally. Hmm. So one other thing that I, I was I was thinking about and have been for the last few weeks, I think I mentioned it one of the one of the episodes as the insight, is this idea of phoning people up and just having a chat over the phone. Oh, yeah. Uh, How's that going? Are you still doing that? No, so classic. <laughs> there's currently too much friction there because at the moment it's a case of calling up random friends and hoping they pick up and if they pick up being like, hey, are you free to talk for the next half an hour? Uh, which just feels like a lot of, yeah, a lot of annoying friction. And so when I'm in the car on the way home, I think, you know what, I might as well just put on my audiobook and listen to some fantasy uh, <laughs> rather than catch up with my friends. And so... <laughs> I, I, I wonder if maybe using the calendar invite system is is one way of. <laughs> oh mate, I'm so adding, I've, I've, I'm so glad you brought that up. Some because, kind of structure to this, yeah, 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 yeah. Because th this is actually while I've been in Japan, I almost have no choice. But okay, there's a service called Calendly. If you work in like tech and startups and stuff, you will be familiar with it because it's just the easiest way to schedule a phone call with someone else. Uh, typically, if, uh, especially if there's like time zone differences, and so like. Uh, for business stuff, usually if someone signs up to a product and they seem like an interesting person to talk to, I will email them saying, hey, I'd love to chat. Let me know when you're free. And I'll send them a link to my Calendly, uh, which basically lets them select a time in my calendar. So it, it only shows them times that I'm available and they can just like select the time that suits them best. Um, and and that'll automatically create a calendar invite, invite for both of us. And that saves the like email back and forth of like, hey, I can do this time and this time and this time. Uh, are any of those good for you? Oh yeah, I can do this time. Uh, what time will that be in your time zone kind of thing? Um, and so while I've been, been in Japan, this has actually been sort of the only way for me to kind of catch up with my actual friends. And so, uh, I've basically been sending Calendly links to a few people who I want to catch up with because it's the only way to do it. And it's actually been really nice. It's, yeah, a, a bit like the, for the same reason it was not, it's nice that we are now doing that. And yeah, I'm actually sending you my Calendly link every week and you're just booking in a time for when you want us to do the podcast. Um, and yeah, it, it's been amazing. And it's, it's like, we, uh, yeah, I think without that, I just wouldn't end up catching up with these people. Mate, I'm literally signing up to Calendly right now. Yeah, it's it's so, it's it's just really good. So you just choose your available hours and available days. So presumably you block off the time when you're sleeping. Uh, well, okay. So what you want to do, you you basically hook this up to your calendar account, Google Calendar or yeah. whatever, and so it'll know when you have events going on. It'll automatically create events for you um, based on the thing. And yeah, you can set like your sort of business hours or like waking hours or whatever, so that people can't book an event for you at midnight or at one a.m. Yeah, we'll, we'll put links to all of these things in the show notes. But yeah, Calendly is absolutely amazing. It's one of those products that's just like super simple. I, I think it's an extremely small team. They haven't like, they're not doing the kind of venture backed startup thing. It's just like a small team building like a very kind of focused product that does one thing extremely well and that like a ridiculous number of people use and pay for. Oh man, 15 minute meeting. This is sick, right? I'm going to start doing this where I'll be like, hey, hey Sahel, want to catch up? <laughs> Book a time slot in my Calendly. Yeah, and, and the, the other beauty of it is that it can automatically create like a video call as the location for the event. So you can, it'll automatically create like a Google Hangouts room. And then like when it comes to the time when you want to chat to them, you both go on the calendar event and you click on the link to the Google Hangout room and you join that together. You can link it up to Zoom. You can link it up to your phone, whatever. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. This is sick. I'm looking forward to playing around with Calendly. 
yeah, it's life changing stuff. Um, is there anything else around this topic that you feel like we haven't sort of touched on? I mean, I think this has been really useful for me so far, just because like, yeah, these are sort of vague ideas floating in my head. I'm like, oh, I think this is important. I think this is something I should, should think about. And now I kind of have these categories of like, you know, structure around sessions, structure within sessions, looking at each other, looking in the same direction. Uh, and so it's just easier to hold. It's just like the, these little categories, are like references to kind of uh, reflect on this information. You know? I think you should turn this firstly into into a tweet storm and just shove it on your Twitter. Yeah, with a link to this episode. Yeah. Um, also, the 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 final thing I was gonna I was gonna reference is this idea of having a personal CRM. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so for those unfamiliar, CRM stands for Customer Relations Management. Is that right? Relationship management. We talked about this on the business personal life thing a few weeks ago. Yeah, we did. Um, and so what I've, I've, I've now started to do is that uh, on Notion, I'm using their personal CRM template. Uh, and so anytime I have a call or a kind of a, a, a sesh with with someone, I add it to my personal CRM with a few little notes. Um, and so I've got like a list of contacts and then a list of like hangout notes and then the hangout notes database is related to contacts. So you can define people who are in, in, in these groups. And what I'm trying to get is that it figures out when the last time you hung out with this person was. And then if it, if it was any time in the, if it was over a month ago or over two months ago, um, and you define that frequency for each particular group of friends, then it reminds you to kind of reach out to them and then. Hopefully the idea is that I'll just be able to send him a message with a, hey, we haven't caught up in a while. Uh, fancy arranging something on the calendar and book the Calendly link. Um, yeah, I think that would be like a, a good end game for for this thing. And then I was also thinking about that thing that you nice, said a few yeah. weeks ago, which is that you've got this friend who after every sesh, he just sends out an email to all the attendees with some notes about what was discussed in the sesh. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. So having, having, having all that in Notion with all the email addresses means it would be trivial to send out an email with some event, with some with some sesh yeah, notes. the minutes. In fact. Yeah, the minutes. I'm, yeah, the minutes. I'm, go, I'm actually going to replace my, I'm going to call it sesh, <laughs> sesh minutes rather than hangout notes. There we go. Nice. <laughs> that, that, that sounds better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I look, I think in theory, this is a great system. I, I'm very interested to see how this actually plays out for you for me, every time I've tried to adopt a personal CRM, the bottleneck is data entry. Um, mm. For example, Notion, we're getting into the weeds here. I don't know. I don't think anyone's still listening to this podcast at this point. Um, the thing about Notion is that the, the UX on mobile is not that frictionless. I've tried using Notion as like my thing for like daily reflections. I've tried using Notion as like a personal CRM. Um, but yeah, the, the mobile U UX is just not that good. And so the data entry process of like writing notes after dinner and stuff is very taxing. And so I suspect what you're going to conclude is that you need to use something like Bear or whatever equivalent you're using nowadays, which is like really low friction, instant data entry thing. You'll use that and then you'll have to transcribe that into Notion at some point. Um, and, and again, that just makes the whole process complicated and harder to stick with. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I've, I think with the notion you can develop, uh, sort of quick capture methods that are a little, are a little bit quicker than default, but yeah, I mean, the way I get most of my stuff into notion these days is by quick capturing it into drafts, uh, using whatever device I have and then, uh, pasting it into notion and my weekly review, which so far I've done about four times in the last two years. But yeah, that's another thing I need to <laughs> I need, need to actively work on just actually making the time to do the, with the, the high leverage housekeeping that comes from, from a weekly review. Yeah. Do you want to set up like a sprint, uh, like a joint sprint kind of thing? I'm sure a couple of our other friends would probably be interested in this kind of thing. Oh, I've, wait, wanna, I've, I've what, been wanting to do weekly what do you reviews mean? for ages. Uh, basically like a sort of uh, a, a weekly review kind of group where, you, yeah, you just kind of keep keep each other accountable. You kind of have a little, little uh, retrospective at the end of each week together where you kind of like say what you wanted to do, talk about your know, roadblocks and things like that. Yeah, man, let's do it. Presumably over uh, over the internet because you're in Japan right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sick, yeah. But yeah, I think, oh. I think having like a small group of people would probably be quite... I'm sure, I, I, have, I know a couple of friends of mine who would be into this kind of thing. I'm sure you, you have a few friends like that too. So we can set up a little group and uh, yeah, sort of do <laughs> sprints together. What do you think about setting up a Slack? <laughs> a Slack for friends? <laughs> oh, mate, this this is super common. Yeah, everyone, everyone in the bear has, has been doing this for years. Yeah. I, I've I've been in friend slacks at various points. I'm not currently in one. I mean, my co-founder and I have a Slack. We're friends, just the two of us in the Slack. Actually, we now have a couple of contractors as single channel guests. 
Look, <laughs> the, the remaining two people who are still listening to this this episode, I don't want to turn them away. But yeah, I, I think uh, friend slacks is a great, is a good idea. And then you can because also like, share like interesting links and stuff. Yeah, because the because WhatsApp groups are just a bit too. It's not it's not the right piece of software for this particular. Yeah, purpose. it's it, it's not like stru- structured enough for sharing rich content and like having a searchable log and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So. Make friend, friend Slack. Slack. <laughs> so uh, the other, the only other issue with Slack is that it's it's so popular amongst business tech people, but it's not at all it's not at all common amongst medics. But I think, yeah, right, friend Slack, it's going to be done. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool. So we've got, <laughs> I've signed up to Calendly. We're going to set up a friend Slack. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man, this is this is progressing. <laughs> this is all the structured socializing. The first day of the rest of our lives. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think that's a good place to end this. Have you got, have you got any insights of the week? Uh, yes, I do. Just, just give me a moment while I get them up on Twitter. Okay. In the meantime, I will offer up one. Uh, and that is something I came across in uh, a podcast between Dave Asprey, who's the guy behind uh, Bulletproof Coffee, Bulletproof Radio, that, that sort of thing, which you might have heard of. And Ryan Holiday, who is, uh, wrote a few best-selling books about stoicism and stuff. Um, and they talked about how uh, they referenced that that classic phrase, uh, live every day as if it were your last. But obviously that, that doesn't really work because if you were to live every day like it was your last, you wouldn't, you know, you'd be eating unhealthy food and just trying to find a mass orgy to go to and like like not doing things in service to your future self. Um, but apparently yeah. what Seneca, you know, the famous ancient Greek stoic said, is that live every day as if it could be your last. And I was like, oh, I haven't heard that one before. That's that's pretty good. Live every, live every like it could be your last. So like you're, you're like getting the value from the day itself, but you're also not aband- like throwing, throwing caution to the winds and just pretending like it's your last day on earth. Oh, are you serious? That, yeah, I think I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. Because the way I've been thinking about this stuff is that, you know, to maximize happiness, it's because it, it sort of act in service to your future self, but also uh, sort of get a uh, kind of treat each day on its own merit. So each day in isolation should be a good day, but also should be contributing to your future self in some way. I back I back that theory. I I just I okay yeah maybe I. Ha- uh, it just doesn't resonate with me the framing of like live every day like it could be your last because like you know every day could be your last like that's <laughs> live every day like it is your last is actually it's taking a position it's actually <laughs> yeah taking a strong position or something uh, but I, I I totally agree with the thing about like trying to live in service of your sort of present and 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 future self simultaneously um, and one one framing that I've I came up with it a, a few months ago I I. I, I live my life by occasionally, and I'm always glad when I do. It's that whenever you, you're you trying to decide whether or not to do something, you should ask yourself, will future me one week from now be glad I did this? Not like future me 10 years from now, not me tomorrow, but one week. I think one week is a good time scale whereby like it will still let you kind of have a bit of frivolous fun, while, but it's like long-term enough. So it, it, one week is such that like, if you're deciding between like sitting at home and doing nothing or like going to the gym that evening, one week is the right, the right period where you'd think, okay, I should, I should go to the gym. However, you know, one week is, is also like not so long that it's just like, oh, I'm not allowed to have any fun in my life just because, you know, me 10 years from now and my like 10 year life plan needs to be on track. You know, it's not quite like that. So that, that's something I've been thinking about. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. Uh, your internet seems to be better than mine. Do you want to read out a review that someone has left for us recently? Oh, sure. Right. How do I find reviews? Um, let's I think we're now close it. to, I think we're close to, I think we're currently at like 800 and something ratings uh, in the Apple store and a couple of hundred reviews, as in like written reviews. Uh, we're on really 300 nice. ratings. I, uh, what are you using for this? I'm using podcast.apple.com. Ah, that's interesting. Because Chartable... Okay, whatever. We, we can look into this. But basically, thank you to everyone who rates and or reviews. Uh, I don't think... I'm actually not sure how you even rate or review a podcast. Yeah, I don't think, think I've why, done it you once rated in my and life. reviewed this one yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's clearly a non-trivial thing. So it's really nice that people uh, do it. Okay, here we go. I've got one from simplystacy.co.uk. Right, actually, let's check out her website. <laughs> simplystacy.co.uk. 
this is some good growth hacking that Simply Stacy is doing, clearly. Um, Simply Stacy <laughs> says, I, f- I found the podcast from coming across Ali's superb YouTube channel, which has honestly been an inspiration. I'm two podcasts in and can't wait to hear the rest. I love the banter and discussions between Ali and Tamor. I love how natural and free-flowing the podcast is, and I would highly recommend you download this and listen to the Abdul Brothers. Oh, That's very nice. Thanks a lot, Simply Stacy. That's uh, Stacy with an E, uh, simply S-T-A-C-E-Y dot co dot UK. She is a blogger from Wiltshire. I also run a YouTube channel. Oh, she has a YouTube channel. No way. Oh, cool. We used to live Good in Wiltshire. Growth hacking. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Maybe we can collab or something. All right, mate. Good sesh. Good sesh. Uh, right. let's, later. let's action these things. Hope you have a good time in Spain. See, see you next okay. week.